Today's reading comes from James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see your brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now someone may argue, some people have faith. Others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have any good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions work together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened, just as the scriptures said, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Rahab, the prostitute, is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them away safely by a different road. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Amen. So this is our second week of the sermon series from the book of James, and we're trying to determine how are we going to live a life worth living just like the poor widow who gave every coin that she had in the temple. In our quest for a faithful life, we're asking ourselves these questions, which may not be up there. Mm, probably not. Okay, so, first question is, we've been saved by Jesus, so what? We've been saved, but if we don't show any transformation or any transformational acts, how can anybody know that we've been saved? How will our life be different? We've been saved, are we going to change? Or are we going to be the same person we were before we were saved? Doing the same things. Cussing the same way. Treating people badly. Doesn't sound saved to me. What influence will our relationship with Jesus have on our actions? We have a relationship with Jesus. We walk with him daily. How does that change us? The second chapter of James is all about how our life must be different. We must be transformed. We have to be different after we're saved. By our acts and actions, people can see what we really believe. We can say we believe all kinds of things, right? But if we don't show the things, show the transformation, show that we're walking with Jesus, people are going to say, big deal. You're saved. I can't tell the difference. If we truly believe in salvation through the sacrifice of Jesus and truly believe, we must start acting like him. If we don't truly believe what we say we do, we can't possibly act like that. We have to act like Jesus, walk like Jesus, talk like Jesus, be like Jesus. You see how that works? No matter what we believe, if we don't show the fruits of that belief, if we don't act like it, have we really been saved? In the U.S., we have a, a way to say this. You talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? You can say whatever you want, but if you don't back it up with actions, so what? When we're saved, we are transformed, and we must start to do the things of Jesus. We have to start acting like Jesus. That's what this whole reading today is about. The actions that we take and the things that we do are based on what we believe. 
Here's what James says. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? One of the girls up here said, well, how about if we share our story? Yes, that can lead to somebody's salvation. When we tell other people, here's what God did for me. They start to wonder, would God do that for me? As sinful as I am, would he do that for me? We all know the answer. But do we tell the story? The same thing is true in our daily lives. We work the jobs that we do because of what we believe. These guys are police because they believe that people's lives are better by keeping the law. They risk their lives because they believe that being out on the street makes people safer. And it does. It does. Teachers teach, we've got a lot of teachers in the crowd here, because they believe that students need a great learning environment in order to have a great life. The same holds true for dentists and doctors and city administrators and plumbers and many other workers. They do what they do because they believe that it helps. If you're just doing a job for the paycheck, you're one unhappy person. Let me tell you. But if you believe in what you do, you wake up in the morning and say, I get to do this. Big difference. I've been using the word believe a lot today. So let's talk about the word believe, especially in the New Testament context. In order to believe in something, you hold it to be true in your mind. And the slide would, would have said, believe equals fact equals truth. Sometimes we use the word believe when we mean, and we believe it to be true, <coughs> the thing to be true. And when we're really solid about that truth, we say that it's a fact. We hold our Christian beliefs that we get from the Bible as fact. When we read the Bible, we read that as a true fact. We don't doubt what's in the Bible. We believe that it is true. And it is fact. And we stake our life on that. Let's see how this works in scriptures. John 3.16 For this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. When we use the word believe in John 3.16, we're saying this is a fact. This is truth. When we believe that God the Father sent his son Jesus down to die for us, we say this is fact. When I believe in Jesus, I am saved. This is one of the first verses our Awana kids learn. And I want them to memorize this. And they do. They take it into their heart. Because this is what the Bible's all about. God's sacrifice. When John 3.16 declares that everyone who believes is saved, that statement isn't just an acknowledgement, it's a fact. And as Christians, we're willing to stake our life on it. This verse is demanding that our lives reflect the fact that it's true. That we are saved by Jesus, that we are transformed, and that we will act like it. John 3.16 isn't really asking, do you believe, but are you willing to stake your life on it? A lot of Christians are in this world now. They're giving up their life because they believe that that statement is the true fact. John 3.16 is asking us, does our life and our witness, our actions and our words, shout to everybody that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord of our entire life? That's what John 3.16 is saying. There are no wishy-washy Christians. If you believe John 3.16, you believe it. There is no wishy-washy beliefs in all of Christianity. It's either... You believe it as fact, or you don't. There's no in-between. You can't pick and choose. Well, I'll take this first today. I'll take this. It's not like a Chinese restaurant. You don't get to take one from column A and column B. You take the whole thing. We know this for fact, because God tells us so 
in Revelation 3.16. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now wouldn't that make a great slide? Actually, I didn't put that picture up there. I was thinking about it, but I didn't do that. That's how serious God is. He doesn't want you wishy-washy. He doesn't want you lukewarm. He wants you either hot or cold. If you're hot, then your actions show that you believe in Jesus. If you're cold, then someone's got some work to do. But at least God knows where to start. He doesn't want anybody in the middle. For James, believing is all about how active we are in our faith life. Here's what he says. If we believe that we are saved by Jesus, do something about it. That's, that's chapter 2 in, in a couple words. If you believe, do it. And as Christians, there are, are so many things that we can do. The first thing we should do is pray. Always pray. Jesus tells us, anything you ask for, you will have. And James, further in the book of James, tells us, don't be wishy-washy when you ask. When you ask, when you pray, pray as if you already have it. You need that kind of confidence that God's going to come through. James says in verses 15 and 16 in chapter 2, Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes, or without daily food, or without Christmas gifts. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, have a Merry Christmas but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? What good would that to send someone away with words when their stomach's grumbling? James is saying that the thoughts and prayers are not an adequate response to every human need. We have to take care of people's needs. Otherwise, we're worthless. He tells us that to send someone away with words or to say that we believe in the words of Jesus Christ and don't do what those words say, it's dead faith. We're still saved, there's no doubt, because we have faith in Jesus Christ that he died on the cross for our sins. We are saved by that. But that faith is dead. Useless. We've got to act on it. He tells us in verse 17, James says, So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Once again, he's not saying that we're saved by our works, but our works come out of our salvation. Because we've been saved by Jesus, we want to do the things of Jesus. And Jesus, we know what he did. He healed the sick. He ate with the sinners. He took 12 guys who were just everyday people and made them apostles because he built them up too. Our faith cannot only be what we read or hear. We must do what the words of God tells us. In, in chapter 1, we went over this last week. James told us, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're just fooling yourselves. We can read it and not do it, but we're not living that full life. Doers of the Word, that, that'll be our theme throughout this whole sermon series. You're going to see it pop up over and over again. And it can be boiled down to this. If we have faith that Jesus saved us, then we have to act on it. People have to know that we're saved by doing the things that we do, like the, the kids said here, and like you said out there. People have to be able to see that we've been saved and transformed. That's what he's saying, what James is saying in verse 16. Now somebody may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? James says, I will show you my faith by my good deeds. It makes sense, doesn't it? If we believe in something, we usually act on it. If we don't believe in it, we just pass it off. We're not going to be bothered. When we show our faith by our good deeds, it brings glory to God. 
And people will know that we're transformed Christians. When we show our faith by our good deeds, the light of Jesus comes shining through us. And that's what Jesus asks for in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. He tells us, in the same way, let your good deeds, Jesus said that, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. The things that we do for God, our actions are very important. Not only to God, but to others. And even to our own well-being. There's psychological tests out there, psychological studies, that tell us that people with a life purpose feel better emotionally and psychologically. When you wake up in the morning and, and you know that you can do these things for God, you jump out of bed and you thank God. Lord, thank you for letting me wake up and do these things for you. People with a life purpose live longer, often past the age of 100, and they're healthier, so living to age 100 is a joy because they have a life purpose. They're not just floating around. And in a Chicago Rush Hospital study, people with a low sense of purpose were 2.4 times more likely to get Alzheimer's. Without a life purpose, you may even get Alzheimer's. Living with God's purpose even helps us face death better. There's a book I just read last week by Dr. John, uh, Don Eisenhower. It's called Life Lessons from Dragonflies. And he tells us, he's a psychologist, people tend to face the end of their life better when they have a clear sense of the difference or impact they have made in their life here on earth. When my mom died at age 51, I vowed to myself that I would never have any regrets. I would never want to be on my deathbed and say, I wish. When I'm on my deathbed, I'm going to say, remember when. That's how I want to go through life. Doing things, and now I get to do them for God, so it makes it even better. God put all of us on life for a purpose. He, just, he doesn't create people to just suck up air. He puts us on earth with a purpose, and his purpose is divine. We all need to pray for what God has designed us for and start doing it. As soon as you get that thought in your head that this is what God put me on this earth for, start doing it. Because that's, that's His will. I love it when science proves the Bible. The Bible tells us to do what we believe in and science tells us it's going to make your life better, you'll be healthier, you'll live longer, and you may not get Alzheimer's if you have a life purpose. We all know how good it feels to participate in things, right? Nobody wants to sit on the sidelines and watch. We like to do things. We like to be active. When I worked in the corporate world, I was doing good things for people. I was helping them with their retirement plan, but I wanted to do more. And when God called me, I knew I had my life purpose. Now, we all don't have to be pastors. We just have to answer God when he tells us Here's what I want you to do. That's all we have to do. When he tells us, I want you to do this thing, we just need to drop what we're doing and get it done. The Bible not only tells us the why we must be saved, because we sin, the Bible tells us what we do once we're saved. Throughout the Bible, it tells us how to live with each other, what to do. As Christians, we must be so transformed by the sacrifice of Jesus that, that we're always thinking, how can I be a doer of God's word? How can I do what he's asking me to do? Nike's, Nike's slogan was just do it. For us, it must be just live it. We just have to live our faith. Continuing in chapter 2, James tells us in verses 19 and 20, you say you have faith, for you believe that there's one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. They tremble in terror because they know God exists. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? James goes on and says that faith without good deeds is useless. James is saying, just live it. Just live your faith. Do the things that God tells you to do. Wrapping up chapter 2, James, Jesus' brother James gives us a perfect example of faith in action in the story of Abraham. 
In explaining the story of Abraham and Isaac from Genesis 22, James also takes care of Martin Luther's concerns that James was promoting works over faith. Here's what he said in verses 21 and 22. Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see his faith and his actions work together. His actions made his faith complete. How in the world could Abraham take his only son, the one he waited 100 years for, how could he take Isaac up to the mountain, tie him onto the altar, if he didn't believe with his entire heart that God was going to come up with an alternative sacrifice? As parents, we know that answer. There's no way that Abraham could have done that if he didn't know for a fact that God was going to provide a sacrifice. Yet Abraham took it to the last minute, he had the knife in his hand, still knowing that God was going to save Isaac, and God did. That's faith. He needed his faith first, and he proved it by his actions. Verses 23 and 24. And so it happened, just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God. He believed God. It was a fact that he knew God was going to save Isaac. And God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He believed first. He had faith in God. And then his actions proved it. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do. 